Okay, guys. This presentation is interactive, so you have to participate. <laughs> well, it's not that. It, it's not that kind. It's it's based mostly on common sense. So, first of all, do humans have instincts? So, if you say humans have instincts, do you know what instincts are? And if you don't, if you don't, you just prove that humans have instincts. <laughs> If you read, if you read the, the pricey, that the little description of me, it says that an instinct is a species-specific, unconscious, complex behavior, which means it's innate to us. It's imprinted in our DNA. So if humans have instincts, are we not forced to act exactly the same? Do we act exactly the same? Why don't we act exactly the same? Environmental. Yeah, primarily because of culture. And culture is exactly the same thing, except in being, instead of being unconscious, it's conscious. So that tells you automatically we should be seeing a psychiatrist because we have a conflict between our innate behavior and our learned behavior. So if you look at the handout, you'll see there are four characteristics to culture. It's learned, shared, symbolic, and integrated. Can you tell me what you think learned means? Learned? Yeah, learned. It means learned. That's good. Can't use the word in the definition Some, though. Somebody taught you. Yeah. Okay, that means then, are you talking about an age difference between the speaker and the learner? Not necessarily. Then you're, you're, working, you're working on the word shared if it's not necessarily. Okay, will this be on the test? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it'll be on your final. Uh, well, wouldn't you assume that learned means someone who knows more than you do regardless of age? So that could be an intellectual difference. And if that's the case, you're looking at a generational difference. And that's usually considered 10 years apart. If you're looking at parents and children, it's 30 years apart. Okay. But the key there, yes? It could be knowledge and by experience. Yeah, it could be. But in, ter in terms of culture, in terms of culture, is that the case? Well, you know, I can't tell you, you look funny today. <laughs> if you were to use your experience and only your experience, and your life is 120 years in length, could the amount of information you collect from experience match the information you could get on the internet or in the library? then I rest my case. It's generational. Okay, so that if learned is generational, can you tell me what vehicles we use to transfer information from one generation to the next? Institutions, name, name one. Family, good. Okay, so let's just use two. Family and school. Does the information you get at school the same as the information you get in your family? Which one, you, which one are you loyal to? Well, it depends on whether you come from a modern society or a traditional society. You guys come from a modern society, so you just lied to me. Because after all, the information you use as your profession didn't come from your family. It came from a school. Okay, and also... That doesn't necessarily mean that we're... Loyal to it. Doesn't necessarily, especially in this country, because if you look at political party loyalty, it usually comes from your family. Yeah. So that would be a good, a good exception to it. But if it comes from professional behavior, it would be from your school. So right. that means I've got two, two levels of conflict going on there. Does that make sense? But you're talking about transmitting culture. Would most of that come from the family? Well, initially. But if you look at what a, a doctor has to go through to become an MD, how much time does he spend in school compared to how much time he spends in his family in terms of what he actually believes and, and, and acts on? Well, usually he's a, has more cognitive learning rather than culture. Well, cognitive learning is a part of culture because culture is symbolic. Well, part of it, yeah. Not only part of it, yeah, almost well, all of it. No, it's not all of it. <laughs> wait well, a second. Culture is vis visceral. But wait a second. Wait, wait until I get to symbolic. Oh, you, visceral, that means instinct. Mm -hmm. No, it doesn't. No. I mean, a lot of stuff. Well, I'll let you go on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> If you, do, if you do shared, then it wouldn't be generational. It would be peer. If it is peer, do you, which are you more loyal to? The peer group or the generational differences? Generational. Generational? If you talk, about, talk to an adolescent, guess what you'd get? Yeah, that's true. But you so, Yeah, I could. But if you look at these two, could, I, could you see levels of conflict developing? And then symbolic. Can you think of symbolic systems that we use? Not the word, 
that one right there. Okay, so. Religion. Religion would be part of your language. It would fit into that category. Religion, wait, what? Religion, part religion of, would religion fold into. Religion symbolic system? I didn't think of it that way. Yeah. Dressing for success. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking more like actual symbols, like math or music. Time. Oh, okay. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, I'm, I've, heard, I've had kids tell me that religion is part of it, but usually we, we ultimately end up agreeing that it's actually a subset of language. But isn't the cross non-verbal? Oh, oh, those kind. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I hadn't thought of that. Making the sign of the cross. Thank you. <laughs> what about art? Yeah, art imitates life. You know, I'm going to have to expand my horizons now that I'm talking to you guys. <laughs> but that's what this is all about. You know the difference between phonetics and, yeah? Could you include nonverbal communication in that? Language, uh, nonverbal language, language is language, but then there's the nonverbal form. Well, yeah, there's also things like social space that would be learned from your culture. For example, uh, you could have a real fun experiment by slowly walk up, walking up against somebody. What they'll do is their social, their intimate space is about 18, in our culture, it's about 18 inches. You can push them all the way up against the wall doing that. That's, that's fun. Actually, it's cruel. <laughs> if you do this one, if you're using a phonetic system that would be like ours, what kind of mental habits would you develop? Yeah, but if you if you talk to a kid and you're trying to get him to spell a word, what would you say to him? Sound it out. Sound it out. Okay, and if you say sound it out, aren't you asking them to analyze? To analyze. Yeah. Right. So wouldn't you be developing an analytical mental mental habit? analysis that involves breaking and then putting it back together so not only would you have analysis you'd also have synthesis which is the, the carbon copy of this thing which is why we spend so much time in our classes talking about critical thinking if you are like Chinese and you're using an ideogram what mental habit do you have well visual because you started with a pictograph and then you abstracted it, which means you're saying this is like that. So that's not analysis. What is that? It's a relational type of. Analysis. Analysis. Analogy. Analogy. And if you're, if you have an anal, uh, an analytical mind, would you be prone toward thinking scientifically? Yeah. Okay. And if you had a mind by analogy, you'd be thinking in metaphors, which would be poetic. So I could take from my two symbolic systems, I could split you into two major different behaviors. If I do math, it depends on the symbols that you're using as to what you're capable of thinking of. Does that make sense? Is that why everybody in the world that is now professional is using an Arabic system? Did, Arab, did the Arabic system permit the possibility of algebra? Oh, yes. yeah. If we didn't have algebra, could we do anything else? So could you use Roman numerals and generate algebra? No. Could you use a Mayan system and generate out? If you've ever seen the Mayan system, you'd say no. Could you use the Chinese system? So this one here is supposed to be objective because it does travel from culture to culture. Are these objective? This means I think one way. This means I think an entirely different way. Is that objective or is that subjective? So could I derive my values, my religion, my identity from the language? That's why language, ethnicity, and culture are usually syn synonymous to each other. So if you take this one, that means I'm going to develop an identity. And if I take this one, that means I am a, a human because I'm capable of learning a symbolic system from another culture without it affecting my identity which means there's only one true definition of the word race. It is human race. All, else, all the rest of them are social constructions. That means that this has the potential of being objective. This was definitely subjective. 
So what would happen if I were to kidnap an Italian kid and raise him in a Chinese family without a set of mirrors? He would learn from his, what he thinks is his parents, the Chinese language, develop an identity. And what level of cruelty would it be to hand him a mirror? Because if he saw himself, would he suddenly be in a, case, a, a state of cultural shock? You take these three things and you put them together and you get the third one, I'm sorry, the fourth one, which is integrated. Now I usually go through and explain the Industrial Revolution using this one. But instead of drawing it on the board, let me ask you a couple of questions. When the Industrial Revolution occurred, was, were machines introduced that you couldn't take home? When that took place, did you have to build something around those machines called a factory? Did the factory draw people to it? That's, is that an economic story? Does that mean drawing people to it is an economic story? Or is that a social story? Well, if I'm looking at the Industrial Revolution from an economic specific and, uh, perspective and I'm trying to tell the story, I would stick only with the economic consequences of the factory. But if I'm looking at the impact on people, I'd be shifting from the economic story to the social story. So I'd have an economic set of institutions complemented by a social set of institutions. Those would be urbanization. Does that make sense? If you introduce machines, does that increase your efficiency? That's an economic story. Does it increase the demand for labor or reduce the demand for labor? It reduces, because a machine is a labor-saving device. That's why it increases efficiency, which means the status of workers would be going up or down. That means their income is going down economically. Socially, their status is going down. Because their income is going down, the person who owns the machine's income would be going Oh. What if they're, if they're more productive in the uh, factory than they were scratching out a living in the dirt? Mm -hmm. Then wouldn't their income go up? Their real income would go up, but their nominal income and job security would go down. Before, they'd be working in a guild, and a guild would be a lifelong job. The employer would give you room, clothing, and food. So you'd be covering your subsistence. Any income you receive would be disposable, and you'd be in that job for the rest of your life. If you're in the Industrial Revolution, how many times are you going to change your occupation? Well, that's called IBM. I've been moved. <laughs> you've been moved geographically. You've been moved socially. So people who are we would call capitalists would be receiving a great deal more money. People who would call workers would be going. There'd be polarization in the status. And the landlords who used to run society because that was the most valuable form of property they had is now replaced by machinery. So their position would be shifting relative to capitalists. So we'd have old rich and new rich. And everybody would be pissed off except the capitalists. Are you with me? So then I would get into an intellectual story then, looking at the attitudes it would generate. So I get liberalism, which appeared first, followed by conservatism because those guys could read and write. Now, if I'm looking at the working class who were illiterate before, they have to wait till the second generation before they could learn to read and write. And that would lead to radicalism, the most dramatic of which would be Marxism. So that my economic story is paralleled by a social story, is paralleled by an intellectual story. And if that's ideology, that generates a political story, which is, means that my culture's institutions are all integrated. One complements the rest. Are there societies where the institutions don't complement each other? Those are societies that are falling apart. Like Rome, for example. If you wanted to explain Rome, you look at the disintegration of the institutions. So I now have a kind of a picture of what culture is by using those four words. Does that make sense? OK. What did Long Beach look like 500 years ago? Okay, so there'd be a hunting and gathering community here, wouldn't there? And then what does it look like now? Is it a natural or an artificial setting? So what does that tell you about culture? You're taking something natural. Yeah. Well, that's the paradox. Does culture enhance our likelihood of survival? 
That's what it's supposed to do. But sometimes does it kill us? Yes. Okay. So that means that it's paradoxical. Sometimes. <laughs> Well, let's talk about hunting and gathering. If you look at my handout, you'll see that's exactly what I want to talk about next, which is hunting and gathering. Is that the oldest, is that the oldest economy? Is it also the one we had the longest? So most likely our instincts in that are actually in tune with each other. Probably our brain chemistry as well. Now, if you were a hunter and gatherer before the, the end of the last ice age, how long did you live? I tried to kill this and it <laughs> <laughs> Actually, no, you're extremely valuable. Unless there was already one in the No, 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 no. Can you have a band of, can you have a band of hold, uh, yeah. hunters and gatherers without females? No, you can have one male. I got it. Okay, good. If you want to kill somebody, kill the male. Yeah, you kill the men because the women are far more valuable as far as perpetuating the band. Because one man can impregnate 20 women. One woman cannot impregnate a single man. <laughs> yeah. But it would be interesting. It would be interesting to watch somebody try. <laughs> okay, so in hunting and gathering, what do you do for what do you do for a living? You move from place to place. What do men do? They hunt. What do women do? Why? Why do women hunt and men gather? There you go, pregnancy. Now I get back to my lifespan. How long do you live? No, I don't think 40 is, is likely. We were large mammals in those days. We probably lived 30. Say, so when did you go through puberty? Now you personally. <laughs> I, I, I know it sounds like I'm talking directly to you, but I want you to participate. Okay, so somewhere between 13 and 15. If you live 30 years, then are you middle aged when you go through puberty? Okay. If that's the case, then how many fertile years have you? Well, if you look, if you look at traditional societies, there, there's no adolescence in any traditional society. So if you look, for example, at a medieval society where you have a guild, you start your apprenticeship in a middle, medieval society at the age of five, and you're a journeyman at the age of 12, which when you're going through puberty and confirmed in the church. So there is no adolescence. You only get adolescence when you've got a peculiar society like ours. Going back to language, we talk about middle age, it, it's a transitional period post-urban world in our, in our past, which right. is true. But with these folks, uh, there are no... There are two things. There are no... There's, uh, there's, child, there is, there's, there's childhood and adulthood. You, 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 you're old enough to hunt or gather. Yeah. And then you're dead. That's right. right. That's, that's it perfectly. <laughs> you summed it up nicely. Nonetheless, how many fertile years have you got? If you're a female. So maybe 15. Okay. Then let's say you have a baby, you carry it to full term. You're a nomad. How far do you walk each year? Each year. Each year. You're following the game. Where do I live? Well, let's make put it on, put you on the Serengeti. Would you not try to ambush the herd as it runs by rather than try to keep up with it? So, if you were thinking about men and women, who would be picking the campsites? The men or the women? The women, because they're the ones that are get the most reliable source of food because they're gathering. So what you would do is you measure out your year and you'd be moving from campsite to campsite, anticipating the movement of animals. Does that make sense? So if you look at the average travel that you'd be doing, it'd be somewhere between 150 and 300 miles. How much do you own? How much do you own? Not much, because you have to carry everything you own. Okay, now imagine yourself to be pregnant and you're carrying half your body weight. What's the miscarriage rate? It's 50%. Okay. Is that good for you? You as a person carrying the baby, is that good for you? If you don't die in the process, yes. Yeah. It decreases the number of babies you have. And it might, um, and you're more likely to miscarry early in the marriage years. And that allows you to mature and become healthy before you have to reproduce. Exactly, and then if you carry the other, the other half of the coin, the baby that comes to full term would be the best possible product that you could produce physically. So that means you've got a healthy baby when you actually have a full term pregnancy. How long do you nurse it? Until it can walk alongside you. You don't want to carry it until it's 15 years old. <laughs> so you're going to. They start at three or something. 
You're going to start. You're going to. You're going to end nursing somewhere between three and four. And when you are nursing, do you do you uh, secrete an enzyme called prolactin that reduces your ovulation? And most likely, there would be 100% birth control for these guys as opposed for us, because they need that type of protection. You don't want to carry two babies at the same time, even though you do have two breasts. Are you with me? So how many babies are you going to give birth to? You've got maybe three is probably a good guess. I don't think four. If you did two, you probably wouldn't see the band last very long. So you'd probably be averaging three babies. Would your population grow? No. So if you look at the entire history of hunting and gathering, the population remained exactly the, pretty much the same. So you're in balance with your food supply. So how many people do you suppose were alive in the world at that time? The right amount. Yeah, the right amount. And the right amount, <laughs> the right amount is somewhere between three and eight million people in the entire globe. Okay, now what happens when you settle, settle down and start growing food? You see, you have a permanent, if you have a permanent location for your food source and your food is reliable, would your miscarriage rate go down? Then your nursing rate would have to go down. The amount of time you spend nursing. Oh, the amount of time. time. Right. Okay. Maybe I, I said it wrong. You mean per child. Per child. Per child. <laughs> and that means your ovulation rate would go, and your fertility would go, and then you have a crisis. Here we are. <laughs> That's exactly my point. So when you start thinking about agriculture, you know that if agriculture started, it had to start for some other reason than what humans decided to do. They had to be forced into it. <coughs> Does that make sense? You have a natural balance between you and the game. That means you only have to work two hours a day. Right. You move from place to place. You have a tremendous array of choices in your diet. You've got protein, you've got carbohydrate, you've got, this is a real nice time. It's called the Garden of Eden, in fact. Okay. So would you want to become a farmer? My case, my point exactly. Okay. So we have to force you to become a a farmer. Are you guys with me? Okay. So what would force you? Well, is this a chicken and egg thing? No, no, there's a definite answer. Okay. It's called climate. The ice age came to an end. Okay. When the ice age came to an end, we have a warming season. It's called the long summer. We're still in it. It's 18,000 years old. Okay, so what happens to the amount of land available to you? Sea levels go up about two or three hundred feet, so you lose, you lose coastal territory. But continental glaciers retreat, so you get all of Canada in exchange. Could we throw it back? I suppose you possibly could. But can you see that you would actually have more land surface available to you? Okay, now would the amount of plants be increase in number? Yes. And then what would you be interested in foraging for? Vegetable plants? Absolutely. And the plants you'd be going for are? grasses. Rice is a grass, corn is a grass, barley is a grass. The only thing that's better than grasses are tubulars like tomatoes, and, no, potatoes and cassava and things like that because they can grow in better and more climate. If you're doing grasses, you have to be in a semi-arid region to do this because this is a semi-arid plant. The thing that's good about grasses is that <coughs> they die in a year. So they have to produce their seeds in less than, in less than a year. So if you look at Southern California, this is the ideal place to be foraging because this is a grassland. When do, when does, when do grasses sprout? Yeah, because we're in a winter rain pattern. They sprout when water hits them. When do they mature? When does the rain stop? Yeah, for us. Now, so it's, it means you'd be doing, you, they would start raining in October and they'd be finished by April, maybe early May. So that's six months, isn't it? In that length of time, you have a fully mature plant and you have a full head of seeds. And it takes about another month or two until that head crowns. So in nine months, you've got your food. Or, yeah, well, and your extra babies. <laughs> so you start foraging. Do men and women forage? Do both of them do it? Men will hunt occasionally. But you get more food from foraging than you do from hunting. So your diet begins to change. Okay, so that takes us now to what are you actually foraging? Oh. 
In natural selection, you have a range in your population, no matter where you are, the alphas to the omegas. The alphas are the winners, the omegas are the losers. Are you with me? Can you have had alphas and omegas under the hunter-gatherer culture? Of Absolutely, okay. you would as well. But that wouldn't make any difference to you. You'd kill whatever came by. You wouldn't be making it. You wouldn't be making any distinctions between alphas and. Yes, it would, because the alphas are going to get the food first. The al they distribute what they want. I'm killing. I'm them. killing animals. Yeah, I would. Yeah, I would. I wouldn't go after an alpha because he's aggressive and yeah. skinny. No, no, I'm not saying that. But the alphas get fed last. Yeah, that's true. Because I'm sorry, the omegas get fed last. No, actually, the alphas get fed last because they're spending all their time having sex. They're actually quite skinny. These are the fat ones because they have no sex. They spend all their time eating. So if you're actually hunting and gathering, you might think an omega is a more attractive animal. But I don't think that that's something you'd actually pay attention to. No, that's natural selection, not, what, not human selection. When humans make a selection, it's called artificial selection. These are my grasses. So this is the one that's reproducing all the time. This is the one that fails. Are oh, you with me? Oh, okay. Because I'm looking at. Well, you know, I just I have to understand my audience. You guys are a lot more peppy than my classes. <laughs> so if I'm looking at omega grass, this is an this is a plant that doesn't distribute its seeds. This is a plant that does distribute seeds. And that means if this plant is successful, it matures at different times of the growing season. Because that means it can scatter its seeds more effectively and distribute them more effectively. These guys are all going to mature at the same time. So these guys are going to be fat seeds. And they are trap seeds. Which means if I'm a forager, which one am I going to pick? Omegas. I'm going to go for the omega. Okay, now the omegas appear once every two million plants. The reason why is because they don't distribute their seeds. So it's a rare event. If I'm picking alphas, I know how much trouble they are. When I see an omega, I'm going to pick it, and instead of eat it, I'm going to plant it. Does that make sense? It takes only, I think it's five generations for you to change a field from alphas to omegas. But once you've done that, you've artificially kept an individual organism alive that should not be there. So when you do that, you just frustrated natural selection when you participated in artificial selection. Then you're trapped. Because that means that you depend on the omega and the omega depends on you. So as your population grows, the number of omegas start to grow so that you start changing the natural landscape. That make sense? Mm -hmm. The so first one. Absolutely not. Survival of the fittest, is, by the way, is, is not the issue. It's reproductive success that is. You can survive to 90, and if you have no babies, you don't count. You might as well be dead. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm sorry about that. That's okay. okay. But if you are 15 years old and have 100,000 offspring, you are really fit. We know what killed you, though. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you have artificial selection going on here, which means you're going to change the ecology. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, so the first technique that was used almost everywhere in the world is slash and burn. burn. And you can tell when this is being used by looking at the tools. This is the beginning of the Neolithic age. And the tools are not chipped, they are polished. The reason why you do that is because you're after an ax head. You have to slash the bark off a tree to dry it out. And then you can set fire to it. That's going to open up a field. So you're going to see this in China. You're going to see this in Mesopotamia. You're going to see it all over except for Egypt, where there aren't any trees to cook. Are you with me? When you do this, you engage in what is called deforestation. You change the climate. So that leads to another event, which has recently been named as ecocide. You know what homicide is. You know what suicide is. You know what matricide, 
Do you know what sibling side is? Sibling side? Sibling side. I can make anything up I want. Animal side? <laughs> but echo side means you're killing the ecology. When you do that to the ecology, then are you trapped with your number of people without a food source? <coughs> yeah, then what do you do? Yeah, eat them. That's, that's one solution, actually. <laughs> you know, if, if, <laughs> the more, shall we say, uh, less cannibalistic approach <laughs> is go to, to rivers. Because rivers flood, and when they flood, they renew their soil. So you don't need trees. You don't need the ash from the trees. Are you guys following this? Okay. Once you go to the river, you're taking advantage of the flood, but the problem with the flood is that you're drowned. <laughs> so that leads to another activity, which is irrigation. That requires organized labor. But it keeps the flooding from the Absolutely. But are you again changing the landscape? That means you're going to confine people on a very narrow strip of land close to the river. So you concentrate them there, which means you need a new technology. That's going to, that's going to lead to the introduction of the plow. Okay. And then it depends if you have to pay close attention to your river as to what kind of organization you're going to have. So. Let's look at four rivers. You guys know, you guys know why Mesopotamia is called Mesopotamia? You knew. Land between, two rivers. Land between two rivers. What are the rivers? Which way did they flow? From north to south. Okay, the headwaters are located where? So they're coming. The, Tigris is coming down from Turkey, it swings around. And then the, I'm sorry, that's Euphrates, it swings around this way. It's about 1,700 miles long. And then the Tigris is coming down along the, along the Iraq mountains, called the Zagros Mountains. That means that this relies on snow melt in order to get its water. And the, the smelt, snow you get there is pretty much like the San Gabriel's we have out here, which means you have an uneven pack. So some years you get a lot of water, some years you get very little water. So if you're in this area, when the flood comes, it comes quite violently. So that means if you're going to dig irrigation here, you have to dig channels and canals to bleed the water off. But it also means that your riverbed is very shallow because it, when the flood occurs, it breaches the riverbed and spreads over a broad floodplain. So this place is going to be quite violent, and that means that if you think about how people explain themselves by religion, what they would say are the gods are whimsical and they created us because we're their slaves. So if you look at Mesopotamian religion, it's incredibly pessimistic. You live as a slave for the gods, then you die and you go to the kingdom of clay. So life sucks and it gets worse. <laughs> Egypt has a Nile that flows from south to north, which means it gets tropical rain, which is the monsoons. And the monsoons fall 2,000 miles away from Egypt. So by the time the flood water gets to you, it's going very slowly. That means this is a gentle river. You don't need to dig canals. You don't need to dig channels. What you have to do is build your village above the water line. Make sense? So when the, the Egyptian Nile floods, it takes only 10 days worth of, of preparation to get the land working. So you can spend all that time between, what, what happens when it floods? It floods in the second week of June and the water recedes in October. That means during that period of time you can't do anything because everything's underwater. Then when October hits, you put in your winter wheat because that's when the, the species of plants you've got is working because the wheat came from Mesopotamia when they were practicing slash and burn. So when you're in this area, you've got six months out of the year where you don't have to do anything. And during, during that six months out of the year, you can build large stone monuments to celebrate your existence. The food that's generated in Egypt is twice the food that's generated in Mesopotamia with one-tenth the labor. 
which means these guys have a different worldview. <laughs> yeah. They think life is wonderful, exactly, and they want to take it with them when they die. <laughs> so you can see a connection between their agricultural vision and their religious vision. So belief and action start to coincide. India is very much like Mesopotamia. This is going to have a central government because the river is so gentle you can travel up and down. The wind blows from north to south, the river flows from south to north, just get on a boat with a sail. Here, I guess six to seven months out of the year you can't use the river because the water's too shallow. But you can walk alongside it. So this one will have city states, this one will have a central government. This one is like this one, so this one have city states. Are you guys with me? Okay. This one, the river is called China Sorrow. It flows from west to east. It travels about 3,500 miles. It starts at an altitude of 3,500 meters. So it's drawing its water from the Tibetan Plateau and from the Himalayas. It's moving through what is called the Los Plateau, which is an organic material made out of limestone or lime, which is decomposing organisms. It's a very fine dust. It's the richest soil in the world. But the river carries nine times the silt of the Nile, the Mississippi, and the Amazon combined. So its bed climbs when you try to irrigate it. What happens is it climbs 50 feet above the floodplain after about 150 years of successful farming. And then it breaches its levees and it drowns everybody inside. So it's called China's Sorrow because it, put, it plays the same trick on you every 200 years. You can't leave it because you have a food, a food dependency because of artificial selection. But if you're going to run this thing, you need a central government. Does that make sense? So the first official historical king is the guy who managed to bring this river under control. And then the, the rest of Chinese history is the need for that central government. So when you start looking at the history, <clears throat> you have the rivers first. It tells you pretty much what their worldview is going to be like. This one, you have to be in harmony with nature. This one, we don't know. The reason why we don't know is because there's so much water in that area that when you try to dig it archaeologically, you make a well. So your evidence is underwater. We know this one, pessimistic, optimistic, and hell, I don't know. Sorry, not, not that. I should have said hell, I don't know. And in this one here, you have to be in harmony with nature. So they don't have a God, they have a heaven. And they say things like, heaven's ways are constant, except when the river floods. OK, so if I were to look then at the geography of this area, this is on a land bridge. It connects Europe, Asia, and Africa, which means if there's any migration, I'm going to have a new people come through here. So this is going to be a broken history. Invasion after invasion after invasion. If I go here, it's isolated on three sides. It's got the Sahara to the west, the Arabian Desert to the east, and it's got the cataracts to the south, which, which are rapids that you, can't, you, can't, you can fortify. And the only way in is through the Sinai. So if there's going to be an invasion, it comes from the north. That means the history here is going to be very stable because I have a central government. If I'm over here, these guys are going to commit Echo side because they're going to try to build foundations to their cities that are waterproof. And that means they're going to burn down all their trees. Okay. Now if I'm over here, the geography there is an absolute nightmare because the agricultural fields flow directly into the nomadic territory with no boundaries. So these guys like to build things like walls, big ones that you can see from the moon. That tells you I, get, I have to have a central government here and a central government here, a city-state system here and a city-state system here. I just want to check my time. Okay. So <clears throat> when I start thinking about this, this one is going to lead to a history that repeats itself. Does that make sense? These two are going to unite into what is called the ancient Near East, combined with another one called Greece, which will combine with another one called Rome. This is going to create an empire that is exactly the same size as, well, almost exactly the same size. This is two point, well, hell, I'll draw a picture. When Rome comes along, it's going to unify 
all these territories except for India. The Roman Empire is 2.2 million square miles. It has a Mediterranean Sea in the middle, which allows for it to travel north to south, east to west. It has 2,200,000 miles of, of paved roads, which means it has a very efficient infrastructure. And it has an army that can cross the empire in two weeks. They're infantrymen, which means they're virtually running. If I'm over here, I have an empire that's 2.6 million miles, square miles. It has a central government, it has an infantry, and also has charioteers. It, does, it can't have any horses because it can't afford to feed its people and its horses, so it has to trade for its horses, which means it exchanges silk for horses, which is why there's going to be a thing called the Silk Road, which is going to eventually connect Han China to Rome. So far, so good? Okay. This one is going to organize in the year 202 BCE. <clears throat> This one's going to defeat Hannibal in the year 202 BCE, which means this one's not going to have a, a political threat after the year 202 BCE, and this one's going to become an official dynasty in the same year. They're going to have the same size population, and they're going to rise and fall roughly at the same time, which means when I look at this, it tells you that the power of the West and the power of the East is roughly the same. The food supply is roughly the same. The organizational pace is roughly the same. But when you start looking at the internal design of them, they become profoundly different. Both are going to fall at the same time from the same mechanism. There's a road between them called the Silk Road. Along that road, the diseases of India are going to travel. There are going to be four major epidemics in Rome, two major epidemics in Han China, you lose roughly 40% of your population, and it's going to be followed by a mini ice age, in which is a cooling trend, and agricultural production will fall off. That means the populations of these will start declining roughly at the same time. In Central Asia, and between them are the nomads who have been watching the Silk Road go back and forth, and they insist upon receiving gifts whenever you travel through their territory, so have, they have a supplemental income based on that trade, which has just disappeared. So they're going to follow the Silk Road in both directions and attack Rome and Han China and bring them both down, which is going to end the ancient era. OK, now, <laughs> what the hell am I talking about? How much stuff have I just given you? It's a lot, isn't it? <laughs> it's a lot. But what's the point? <laughs> when culture began, when agriculture began, artificial selection began, Population exceeded the food supply, so we were out of balance with nature. Did we have to find a solution to that? We started the solution with irrigation, and we were successful, which still drove us toward ecocide. We put pressure on ourselves to be able to maintain the food source. Both Rome and China fell for the same reasons. They were trapped in their own food production. Then once they were defeated, <coughs> Rome is going to break up because it has units like Mesopotamia, Egypt, Greece in it. China is going to reassemble because you can't run that country without running that river. So this one is going, the Roman story is going to break into three parts. It's called the Middle Ages for Europe, the Byzantine Empire, which is the Eastern Roman Empire, and Islam, which is in the south. And it'll never reassemble. Whereas this one will reassemble over and over and over. They get better at it. So the times between chaos, the, the length of chaos between their dynasties get shorter and shorter. They perfect it into a fine art. <clears throat> so if I were to project this into the present, can you see us committing ecocide today? So is it possible that by creating the World Health Organization to eradicate disease, we have not created another problem called famine? So are we solving one problem to create only another? So is artificial selection a boon or a bane? Depends on who you are and <laughs> It also depends on when you're talking about. Does civilization enhance our conditions of life? OK, but you can't say categorically that it does. Does it periodically cause us to do rather horrible things? 
So can you see sequences in the history of human beings where success actually creates the circumstances of failure? Are we now facing that? Okay. So if I, if I look at the population growth today, the question would become how much can the Earth abide? What's the current population? I thought it was 7 billion officially, wasn't it? Yeah. Okay. Do you know what the doubling rate is? Yeah. Okay. At how, how fast a rate are we growing? Yeah, it is exponential. That's why it's called neo-Malthusianism. Neo it's not the theory that he generated in 70 k But it, it, is, it is, we're pressing the, the limits of what the Earth can produce. And at the same time, are we not having an impact on climate? So are we still trapped in the boundaries of ecocide? Is there a way out of that? Do we have the institutional organization that would make that possible? Globally? Yeah, globally. Isn't that, isn't that a fundamental question we'd have to address? Well, there's a difference between possible and actual. Yeah. And could we make it happen? Sure. Will we? No. <laughs> okay, so are we, are, we, are we going to go here? Yes. We're on the cusp. There. We're on the cusp. Yeah, I was, I was just doing some charts this morning. I was trying to get a hold of, uh, uh, Google is a wonderful, wonderful tool. And I got um, the ancient and the medieval period of, of climate, global climate, all these different charts. They, they, um, and now I got another one from 1880 all the way up to 2000. And it just shoots it right off the chart. It goes up. We've gone up around six degrees centigrade. We were minus, point four, minus 4 degrees centigrade uh, in 1880, and we're now 2 degrees above centigrade globally. And that, the impact on, on the oceans that that has, I think it's going to kill the algae. Well, that's what I'm hearing. It's going to kill the algae, which is the primary source of oxygen for us. And then what ha usually happens is the Earth corrects itself by wiping out the species that made the mess. And then if you think about evolution just in general, 99.99% of all species have gone extinct. And we're well on the way, consciously traveling in that direction, unless we can get our together and stop that. But this one started as soon as we started artificial selection, and it haunts us now. So I didn't think I was going to finish. <laughs> So I shot through that as fast as I could. I hope I didn't lose you guys. No, that's great. Okay. But I'm done. Does anybody have any questions for Steve? Uh, yeah. I was just wondering, when you say that the shift from hunter-gathering to uh, like agriculture, mm -hmm. the end of the ice age, mm -hmm. you talked about more land. Was it the fact that the game became spread out or was it the abundance of grasses? It was the abundance of plants, primarily. The other thing too that became more abundant is fish. So it was easier to stay in one place and forage for the grasses as well as fish than it was to chase the game. So you didn't have to go from place to place, which is what impacted the miscarriage rate and, and uh, the length of time you spent nursing. So I, my understanding is uh, we went from eight and a half million people globally Within one millennia, we were 100 million people. And that meant, if you look at it, if you distribute it, I think it's one person for every 500 square miles when we were hunters and gatherers, to uh, one person for every five square miles. So it's like the Earth all of a sudden, all of a sudden shrank on us. If you look at the foraging patterns, we're also concentrated in certain geographic areas, mostly in Mediterranean climates. So. That's why when you start looking at the, the discovery of the grasses that become domesticated plants, they happen roughly at the same time. Well, not roughly at the same time. I should take that back. The earliest domesticated plant we know of is rye in Mesopotamia, 9,600 BCE. And also in China, there was a domesticated rice on the Yangtze River in 9,500 BCE. But the Yangtze River wasn't used for Chinese civilization. They had to use millets, which, which, is, which was in the north, and that took 5,000 BCE. So this isn't exactly the same time, but it's roughly within the same ballpark. Any other questions? <coughs> yeah. So the conclusion of this presentation, what are we to take from it? Are we to look for venture 
solutions, solutions, panic. <laughs> no, I don't think panic think is the what, issue. Like, if I was going to talk about this, what would I get from this? I mean, I'm, I'm thinking, ah. The solution has to be political. We have to be mobilized. And in this country, we're lucky because we can talk about this stuff freely. So we have to get behind whoever is in charge of this country to alert them to the dangers. And his, history indicates that if you don't do that, civilizations collapse. Like in Mesopotamia, the evaporation rate is so, so high there that when you irrigate, irrigate the land, you actually put salt in the soil. So Mesopotamian history is civilization marching up river to get away from the salt that planted in the soil. Egypt doesn't have that problem because the water falls 2,000 miles away, so the water sweet when it gets up to Egypt. And also the, the river bed is very, very deep. So there's a very narrow evaporation phase, and that water is soft enough that you could wash your hair in it as if you were washing your hair in beer, which I understand is supposed to be a really good thing to do. Our area here, yeah, we use the Colorado River, which is more like Mesopotamia. So the water that empties into Mexico is pretty, pretty brack, pretty salty, which is why the Mexicans don't like us too much. Because we've taken all the water out of it by the time it gets there. That's another example of ecocide. Ecocide's everywhere. Any other questions? I don't, I don't want to depress you guys. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 <laughs>